Welcome everybody and this is a presentation for Plant Medina and the road ahead for us and the, the next steps really into a whole new season of being a church together. And it's my hope that by the end of today's presentation uh, you'll be able to leave here knowing about where we have been as a church plant and where we're currently at as, as well as where we'll, be, where we'll be moving into the next year. I want to re-clarify the mission of Plant Medina um, and, and our part as a church in Medina in that. Um, I said since day one that Plant Medina is not a name of a church. It's a name of a missionary movement in Medina County. Um, so I'd, I'd like to also, we've a lot, a lot of what we've been doing is we've been brainstorming and just kind of praying and prayerfully and relationally discussing church and our experiences with aspects of church life. And so there's been some uh, primitive values that kind of emerged and things that that we we want to become and I want to go over that and what our services will be like and the the meaning of the name of our church it's kind of unique and and how how you as the person listening to this can serve and be a part of the worship be a part of the mission um, of plant Medina and our church um, which will be named soon um, building excitement for that name introduction. But I also want to introduce missional communities, which missional communities are a way of living out the gospel uh, Monday through Saturday, right? The time in between the service. Um, it's taking the, the experience of the worship service, the truth of the gospel that was preached and the message and the reality of um, the communion together and with God and to live that out together and to make disciples that will make disciples of Jesus Christ. So uh, I'll go over what they are, I'll go over how they meet, and where our first one in Medina will begin. I'll look at the calendar for the rest of the year, a tentative plan for some meetings and, and some outreaches, and uh, also like to share with you just really some midterm and long-term goals that um, God has laid in my heart for Plant Medina and that um, top secret name of our church. So where have we been as a church plant? Well, um, as I said in the intro video, um, we've really been in a very, um, very highly relational environment that's been informal. And I know a lot of people have been just like, okay, give me the teaching. Give me like, I want to get to singing songs and services and uh, give me some Bible studies and stuff like that. But I've intentionally been wanting to hear the stories of where people have been coming from um, because we have um, Baptists and Episcopalians and, and Evangelicals and non-denominational people and people who really haven't uh, been in the church and Roman Catholics. and We have all different flavors and types of Christian uh, followers of Jesus in this group. So I just wanted everybody to be on the same page with, with a lot of where everybody's coming from and um, where we've been. we've been. I've been networking and scouting out. Uh, where what's going on here and where do we fit in? I've been um, meeting with a lot of the pastors in town and getting to know them and building relationships with them and hearing about the stories of the saints here. What what are what are the the Christian churches doing in Medina? How are they impacting it for the gospel and how can we help and and what maybe um, is is missing and could we fit in there? And uh, we've been having these discussions, like I said and. We've we've been allowing space for people to share, and we've discussed things like community and church. Uh, what what are um, what's a church culture like? What is a vision of a church, and what are its values? We've talked about the big loaded word mission, um, and Celtic Christianity, and prayer, and Anglicanism. <laughs> we've talked about all these different things, and we've we've had a great time. We've been in all around Medina, and. I, I harvested a lot. Um, if you've been to any of the meetings, you notice I always carry my little black moleskin uh, notebook. And I've been um, zealously taking notes and trying to harvest ideas and what I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying through a variety of uh, th things and themes that I see people um, sharing. Um, so I've been doing that as a way to discover our early values as a church. What are the spiritual gifts? What are the ways that God has blessed us that we could pour into others and what what do we have and what do we lack um, so what did I harvest I, well first I, I found that we're, we're a community that wants to really value teaching and equipping 
what I mean by that is um, that we really want to learn more about the Bible. Um, you know, we really want to know about like even like how to read the Bible. How do you navigate it? Uh, I remember my wife when she became a Christian. She she transferred to a Christian school. Never really read the Bible, and they said, "Open open your Bibles to uh, Philippians two and." My wife, you know, opened up the first page and just started going Genesis, you know, and just kind of going through, like, from the very beginning to the end. And, you know, fortunately, she had somebody next to her. She's like, no, 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 it's all the way in the back. <laughs> and um, so just very practical. We want to we know how to study the Bible and, and how, how to apply it to our lives. What, is, what does Scripture say for our lives? And we want to equip the church for ministry. Uh, because it's it's really just it's not really the paid religious professionals that are called to do the ministry. That we're called to be equippers. As a pastor, I'm called to equip the saints for ministry, and um, Scripture has a big role in that. So I want everybody to be missionaries uh, to the, to their networks of relationships that they have. Um, so there's a lot of equipping that goes on with that. You know, I I, I have a seminary education. I, I feel like. I was blessed to have that and to take a three, four years to really study and learn Greek and Hebrew and all that fun stuff. And I feel called because of that time to really share that. Everything I learned, it's it's for the church. It's not for myself, my own um, like you know education and to, you know to boast a res on a resume. It's it's for the equipping of saints for ministry. Um, and, you know, a big thing that we, we come to value and I keep hearing is worship. People people just come up to me and they say, you know, the same person almost always says every week, Ryan, when are we going to celebrate Holy Communion? Ryan, you know, when are we going to sing? Can we sing more? Can we sing songs? I want to praise God in song. Um, you know, there's been a hunger to worship together and we're getting there. Um, authenticity. From day one, we, we had a, a woman, we were talking about, you know, how fake some churches are and how there's these cliques and things like that. And, it, you know, even well-intentioned churches, they don't mean to do this. Um, and a lot of times we wear masks really to hide our brokenness because um, we don't really want to give it to Jesus. Or we don't want others to see it or we want to act holy. Um, so, you know, we want to be a place where authenticity is valued where, you know, you, you could have your brokenness and you could uh, walk with it and give it to the Lord and to be healed and to um, be transformed, really, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to be a place where story is, is regularly shared. Uh, we want to be a place where, you know, people are, are sharing, you know, how Scripture is alive in their lives you know, you could say, you could talk about, you could read, you read 2 Corinthians 5.17 about, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things are new. You could read that, right, in scripture and be like, that's a great idea. That's a great concept. But when you hear a story, when you hear a testimony of your, of, of your little brother, the party animal, or when you hear a story of the, of, of the cokehead in high school, or when you hear the story of the perfectionist, the holy roller, and how they're hiding this closet life, when you hear how Jesus transformed their lives, that, that, that brings scripture alive. And we want to regularly value and have story. Family. And family, we don't just mean uh, that we're trying to market to families. Uh, we, we love families, I, you know, and, but we, we, we realize that the church is really, is really could be viewed in familial type of language of, of you know, of, of a family of relationships. Um, so in a family, you have the weird uncle and, you know, you have, you know, the, the, the aunt that is so sweet that you could go to. Um, you have all these variety of different characters and a church is like that in a lot of ways. But we, with a family, like you don't exclude people from being in the family because they're older or because they're younger. Um, for us as a church family, we want um, even kids and we to participate in the worship and being part of the church and learn how to pray for people and learn as little kids, as little babes in Christ. We want to teach our kids how to pray for us as their parents. 
Um, maybe they could discern we're having a bad day, and maybe they'll offer to pray for us. How about that? And we want our kids to be in, in worship with us. So we want to recognize them and pray for our kids every week and as before we dismiss them to a, you know, their, their um, children's school. And we want them to be part of communion. It's important to us because it's important to Christ. And <clears throat> a big thing that we came out with is mission. And mission is such a loaded term. It doesn't just mean uh, something you do once a month or something um, that you go and you travel across the world to be a part of on a short-term mission trip. Mission is God's plan for redemption for the entire universe. And that involves Jesus eventually coming in the fullness of time as one of us, as dying as one of us, so that we may be reconciled and have a right relationship with God the Father. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a mission we're called to share. That's a story we are written into, that we are characters and that we carry. And we get to actively participate in this with relationships, with people who don't know Jesus, with our neighbors. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we build bridges of relationships um, and we feel the Holy Spirit will just compel people to ask us, what is different about you? like the early church, that we want our love to be so radical and selfless that people are dumbfounded, that in this consumeristic culture that they will just be like, what is all this about? What's your angle? And when you just say it's free, it's free. Christ gave it to me. And I just want to, I just want to help you guys with this. It's going to, it's going to change. It's going to be a paradigm shift. So where are we at? Um, we're kind of, we're taking that deep breath before you jump off a, a, a cliff. Um, you know, I shared about, you know, in, in Amherst, we had these quarries that it's almost a rite of passage for generations. These, these sandstone quarries flooded and, you know, you sneak back there and, you know, when you're in high school, you're not supposed to, but you sneak back there and, you know, everybody jumps off them and you, you know, it's been happening. You might've seen it a couple times and then it come, becomes your turn and you, you know, you look down, it's pretty high up and you, you take that deep breath and you know people have done it. You know people haven't been injured. You know it's straight down shot and all this. Uh, and you take that deep breath and you build momentum and you start running and you got to decide, am I going to keep running and just let this momentum carry me? Or am I going to fall down and wipe out and, and not go any further? And uh, we, we want to, we're at that place where we're, we have that momentum that's going to start picking up and we want to go forward because we believe it is, it, it is God that is compelling us forward. And we're transitioning from this informal type of gathering um, to a more intentional way of being the church. Um, it does, this doesn't mean like churching it up and, you know, wearing suits and things like that. This means that we want to intentionally grow more like Jesus. So we want to study scripture more. We want to be uh, out in the community more asking how we can, can we pray for you? Asking, uh, like, how, how can we serve you in a real way? Or do you want to help us serve this neighbor? Asking people to serve as well. Um, we we want to go to being a team in ministry, um, not just relying on the gifts of one paid uh, professional, but realizing that the Holy Spirit has given the whole church a variety of gifts of, of teachers and, and prophets and apostles and, and um, pastors and all these different gifts um, that really um, should be working in unison. And, you know, I want to clarify Plant Medina's purpose. And Plant Medina, like I said, it is never intended to be a name of a church. And when God called me to, to Medina, I, I saw something more than just one church. And I saw uh, multiple churches. Uh, I didn't see a mega church. I saw just multiple churches of relationships and uh, of, of missional communities, of ways that you live out the gospel. So Plant Medina's mission here is to revitalize Medina County by doing three things. Very simple planting Anglican churches, developing missional communities, and networking with local churches to advance the gospel. I'm going to go into those first two later, but let me just give you an example of the third, um, networking with local churches to advance the gospel. Currently, um, there is, um, there's very little Christian type of ministry going on at the high school. 
and a few pastors. Um, if, actually, I was at one of the first meetings right when I moved into Medina. A friend of mine invited me to come, and, and it, these people had a burden because their kids were entering in high school, and they really wanted a, a ministry that would uh, share the gospel in a real way with high schoolers. And uh, so they they, um, they have started wanting to get a young life ministry going at the high school. And uh, they did a, they did a, you know, pulled some numbers from the youth pastors. And we think there's, there's probably about a thousand high schoolers who don't know, who don't really know Jesus, who, who um, could care less about him. And um, so we've been, we've been doing everything we can to help get uh, a young life ministry going in Medina. And it's not just Plant Medina, but it's multiple churches. So where are we going? Here is the broad overview of Plant Medina. Um, I'm not going to go into either of these too much right now. Um, as you can see by this little um, arrow thing, that these two really aren't either or. It's really ideally both and. Um, but uh, there, there unfortunately will be people who love this idea of missional communities and, and maybe not uh, being inside a church building or like a church regular worship service. Maybe they desire more for to to be like out doing and and growing in Christ, but maybe not like the worship service. And there's going to be others who like love the worship service, but are scared to go out into the the hard places of the world and to um, to share their faith by by serving. Um, ideally, both these go together, and I'm going to go into how that works here soon. So. Um, and that last page, let me go back. There you go. See see that little name there? St. George's Anglican Church. There it is. There's the, there's the, the sneaky um, name drop right there. St. George's Anglican Church. And who was St. George? Um, man, that picture does not make him look tough at all. But St. George was a warrior. Uh, St. George was a, a saint in the 3rd century. And he, he was born to noble, uh, a noble family in the Roman Empire. And he, he chose to uh, join the military. And he joined the military and he worked his, ways, wor- worked his way up high to a high rank. And uh, was, he eventually became the protector of the emperor himself. And the emperor at the time, his name was Diocletian. And Diocletian, um, you know, it was always kind of faux pas, illegal and dangerous to be a Christian. Um, what we take for granted today in America um, was dangerous and got you killed back then. But Diocletian d- changed his policy to make it even more aggressive in his persecution of Christians. And he was making every every military officer make a sacrifice to him as a god, as the son of God. And uh, George boldly said no, and he not only said no, he shared the whole gospel. He said, there is only one Son of God, and that is Jesus the Christ. And this is what he did. He, he was died, he was he resurrected, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And this is this is what I believe in. And, um, you know, <laughs> the emperor goes, you know, pull him aside and say, hey, George, buddy, uh, you protect me. I want to protect you now. Um, why don't you recant that? Why don't you just say I'm delusional? I don't believe in Jesus. Make the sacrifice, man. I'll give you land. I'll give you money. Uh, you'll live a happy life. Um, and George said no. <laughs> and he gave the ultimate testimony. Martyria in Greek, he was a martyr. Um, he gave the ultimate witness of Jesus Christ and was martyred um, in a very graphic and, uh, way. And there's many legends about St. George, um, about slaying the dragon. And that is really cool. That's a cool picture, isn't it? Of um, what Jesus Christ has done. That Christ's death on the cross has freed us um, from our bondage to sin. From our propensity to do the things that we know deep down we probably shouldn't be doing. That we, we kind of even get excited about doing in a strange way. But that Christ has died for that sin. He's died for the, that, that guilt, that shame that you carry, he, that, that made us slaves. He, he died so that we may be free in him. And, and Christ slayed Satan and his demons. They have been their defeated foes, those tempters. Um, they have been defeated. And we have victory by Christ's death and his resurrection. So... Uh, that picture, man, that just that just hits home the reality of what Christ has done. 
So why name a church after St. George? Because we could tell that story. We could tell the story about how George, you know, was faithful. Um, he that he suffered persecution for the sake of Christ. That he he persevered to the end. That Christ said to him, "Good, um, well done, good and faithful servant." Um, and and we we want to live that out. Um, you know, people people like Saint George, Saint anything. Um, people kind of you know, we could scoff at the name because it has a saint in it. Um, for us, like for, for us, it's just important to rem remember that Christianity didn't start 10 years ago. Um, that, that, uh, it's, it's this long unbroken chain that really it's, it's remembering that, that God in, in the history of creation of humanity has been pursuing us that he desires us to be restored to relationship with him, that he loves us, that he loves us so much that he sent Jesus. Um, so we want to remember this long line of faithful witnesses of Christ, um, that our church um, is connected to that in some way. Even in our name, um, we want it to be kind of a throwback, right? So what, what is our worship going to be like at St. George's Anglican Church? Well, uh, there's going to be singing, and there's going to be awesome singing, and it's going to be lively, it's going to be holy, um, it's going to be ancient future. Ooh, and what what ancient future means? It's going to be. Um, it's, it's, there's this passage I think it's in Matthew that t it talks about bringing out your treasures old and new. Uh, you know, we're going to ask the older generation tell us tell us those songs that you used to sing. Help us help us rediscover those for today. And, and we're going to teach some new songs, too, that the Holy Spirit has given and birthed into our community. We want to praise a holy God with those songs. And um, reading scripture is an important part. I got saved. I, I came to know Christ, and uh, my lifestyle got converted um, by reading scripture. And there'll be... Um, There'll be plenty of scripture that is read, and uh, you know when when the the early church, uh, when the you know when the Bible is getting formulated, what happened was you know people didn't sit down with the Bible like we had now, and they didn't study by themselves, um, reading it silently. Uh, what happened was a letter, you know, one letter was sent uh, to a church, and one person would read that whole letter to the whole church, and the whole church would be knew that the person who wrote it, maybe it was Paul or maybe it was Timothy, and they would just be hanging on every word because it would be directed to them. So we want to read scripture in a way that it is directed to us as the people of God, that we could hear God's uh, Holy Spirit saying, this is about, this is your story too. I'm calling you to this as well. Live this way. Um, so we, we also want to tell the story of how we are living that way. We want to hear testimony from our church family. Um, and we, we think this puts everybody, you know, at the same level. You know, whether you're ordained or not, you know, we all have a testimony of Jesus. Uh, we, we all are, are, have brokenness that, that, is, is not yet conf uh, that is not yet trans um, transformed to the image of Christ. So we want to tell the story of how that is working. It's out to give hope to people. Um, uh, I was a mess when I first became a Christian. If I didn't hear people's stories saying, it's going to get better, like, you can overcome this, man. I did that. I overcame that that naughty sin, right? It gave me hope, and it gave me a, a human example to walk me through it. Um, so we want we want story time. We want people to tell testimonies. Um, you, know, and, you know, my job as a pastor uh, is, is to really preach the gospel, and what I mean by this, I don't mean a 50-minute lecture um, using all those fancy words you learn in seminary. I, I mean, very simply speaking, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is the good news of Christ. I want to share what that, what, what that means. I want to share uh, the scriptures that were read. I want to say, well, this is what it meant. This is the audience Paul is writing to, or you know that that Jesus was speaking to. Uh, this is what it meant then, and this is what it means now. This this is how we are to live because of what Jesus did. And I want you to go away, uh, like just filled with uh, with the reality of the gospel in your life for that week. So there's going to be confession time and. Confession means a few things. We're going to uh, confess our common uh, and unbroken faith 
according to the creeds of the church. Um, we're going to confess, you know, um, I believe in Jesus Christ. We're going to confess these, this, these creeds that have been spoken for thousands of years, um, that have been the, the standards and the benchmarks for, um, for orthodoxy, for, uh, for giving right glory to God, the, the standards of the early church, um, for, for being, um, being in the right faith that the apostles taught, right? Uh, for not being heretical or, you know, creating a new type of religion and saying it's Christianity, right? So we want to confess this in response to what God has done, that we want to live this way, that we believe this, that we confess this. And um, not only that, we want to confess our sins. We want to confess our shortcomings, our hang-ups. We want to confess our need for Jesus, Um to prepare for communion. We want to um, confess not only our personal sins, but our communal sins as, as the body of Christ of how we have failed to live up to, to what Christ has called us to as his church and how we want to be better. We want to be better witnesses. We want to love the neighbor and the outsider and the foreigner better. Um, and we, we will hear God's forgiveness spoken over us and his promises spoken over us from Scripture. And that prepares us to come to the table. Um, we'll, we'll come to, to the table together and we'll commune together with God at the table and we'll truly encounter Christ. During our services, we do use um, bread and we do use wine as the early church did. And, and we, we, don't, uh, we offer these to God. We offer the, 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 the communion elements, but we also offer our financial tithes to God and any other gifts that we want to give to the, to, to the church or to people. We give them to God because He deserves it. We give God, you know, whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of, of your income, we give it to God because we recognize that all of it is God, all that we own. All that we have and all that we have given away belongs to the Lord. So we give that as, as an offering. And I used to have a hard time with this, mostly because I was pushing back from the tradition I grew up in. And I, was, I would just say, oh, we just need a lockbox in the back and people could um, not be guilted into giving. And, and, you know, it was almost like this thing that, you, oh, you shouldn't give. But, um, you know, <laughs> it is good to give to the Lord. You know, it is it is an offering to God, not to Plant Matina, not to St. George's. We're offering these things to, to God, our creator, in whose image we have been created and whose likeness we are to grow into. So the whole service is a prayer, really. It's a whole offering of thanksgiving, of making Eucharist to, to the Lord. Um, we have a variety of different types of prayers. We're going to have spontaneous, kind of charismatic prayers. We're going to have written prayers. We're going to have prayers of the people where somebody will pray something, um, uh, you know, pray for those who have, who have gone to be with the Lord, and people will speak out the names of those people. We'll say, we'll pray for those people who are suffering with ailments and diseases, and we'll speak out those names. Uh, prayers of the people, and after communion, um, we'll have to, we'll have a time of of singing, of light singing, and uh, that will lead us into a time of prayer, of reflection. Of I, I foresee families coming together to pray during this time after communion, uh, praying for their family. I see people who want prayer for healing, or maybe prayers to receive Christ. To, to make a commitment to somebody that they want to follow Jesus and to be discipled, um, there'll be prayer ministers that you could go and pray to. And I'm just so excited about our worship services. And right now, um, we're looking for a place to nest. Um, I'm, this, is, this currently isn't, you know, that's there's a little, it should be an asterisk there. It's not official yet that we, we, will, we will be har nesting at harvest. Um, we may do that. But wherever we do gather, um, it'll begin the, the second uh, weekend, the second Saturday of November, which will be the 12th. We'll meet Saturday nights at 5 p.m. You get to sleep in Saturday morning. How cool is that? Um, and we'll begin just meeting the second and fourth Saturdays of each month. And uh, we'll, we'll meet together for worship. And, uh, you know, the, the other days we'll actually be meet, meeting in missional community gatherings around, around Medina. And I'll get into that later. But what do we need for these services? Well, each of those, each of those things that I hit on, we really need people to move and enter into. Um, we need an altar guild. And if you're not familiar with 
Anglican terminology and all that. Essentially, an altar guild is responsible for setting up the Lord's table and making making sure everything is properly cleaned up afterward. Um, we don't throw um, consecrated uh, bread and wine, you know, in, in the trash. You know, we believe that um, that that is a <laughs> Christ as if it's been consecrated and it's. Um, that's holy. So um, we, we, we disperse it in the proper way, and um, there will be training for that. And we just want to make sure that these people, these people in the altar guild will be responsible for making sure that we have bread and wine for the service. Uh, I'd love it if people in our church uh, community could actually bake um, the bread. And, you know, maybe maybe there's even some of those out there who, who will make the wine. I don't know. But uh, what do we need for our services? Um a space ministry. This is really important. If we have um, certain things that we're certain um, visuals or um, graphics or things or icons or anything that we any anything that we would use uh, for visual or around the worship sanctuary, um, we want to make sure it's set up and ready to go before people come. And we want to make sure this is the really important part that the sanctuary is totally clean. That it's even better than how we found it. Um, that we could really bless the community that lets us come in and nest our church service at their church building. Um, children's ministry is really important. Um, Joy, Joy is um, she did the, she did children's ministry at a huge church in Texas, and a Christ Church, and she's volunteered to help with curriculum and teaching. And my my wife Bridget wants to help, and she wants in on that. And uh, maybe you have a heart for children. Maybe you could help, um, but. Um, like I said, children are going to be part of the singing and the praising of God and song, and then they'll be released. They'll come forward, and we'll all pray and acknowledge the children and pray for their for their time with Jesus, and, and they'll go have their lesson, and then they'll come back for communion. And we'll have a nursery, hopefully going from day one. And music ministry, we'll have somebody who will be um, re really leading us singing, because I'm tone deaf, and I'm a horrible singer. But uh, the, the music minister, the this whether it's a choir or whoever whoever it is, I really would love them to lead the congregation in, in singing songs to the Lord, but also discerning when um, when you know the lyrics on the page end, but the song is still going. You know what I mean? Like, have you ever been singing a song that is just so good, and you know the words end, and maybe you know the song should end, but you feel like you just want to get another verse in or hit the chorus again, or maybe it's really... Uh, birth this emotion or this this maybe you just want to give thanks to God. Well, they, they should dis the music minister should discern that and offer this time as more spontaneous time for prayer and thanksgiving to God. A hospitality team is so important to us um, because we we want people to feel welcomed and hospitality isn't about cooking a dinner and entertaining your best friend and. You know, it's hospitality is really about um, inviting your 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 enemy to come and have dinner with you. You know, it, it's about making room for the stranger, the outsider, at the table, and that's what we want to do. So we want a, a unique team to really disarm people and their stereotypes of church. And as they come in, I mean, in this cynic, cynical age, it might be hard, but I believe all things are possible through Jesus Christ. So um, this team would really shepherd newcomers. They'd hand out, you know, bulletins and all that kind of stuff, but they would really take an interest and shepherd them and, and you know, just serve them. And they'd, they'd coordinate food and beverages and things like that. Um, you know, I, I went into how important it is to read scripture over people. So readers would um, really take to that ministry of reading the word of God over people, um, servers and ushers. Um, these people are just really, really necessary um, to just the, the logistics of a service, of uh, assisting and distributing the body and the bread of Jesus, of bringing the offering up for everybody to see what we're offering to God. Um, and to, to just to help with like the logistics of everything. And I'm looking for a deacon. I'm looking for a person who's called to be ordained as a, as a servant of Christ, to be a vis visual reminder of, of a servant. And you see um, in 1 Timothy 3, the, the, the standard for a deacon, uh, I encourage you to read that, to pray about it. If you feel called to serve, I'd love for you to um, call me, email me, um, get in touch with me about being a deacon at, at St. George's. 
So this is the, usually the time where um, during the presentation, I you know this was a lot of information for everybody. Um, so I just took some questions, clarified some things, gave let people get something to eat and drink and stretch their legs. But I'm going to press on. So missional communities, I, I've been talking about St. George's and, and what that's like, um, what that's like as far as a worship service. And now we're getting to missional communities, which, which really are the vehicle by which we live out the gospel. Uh, it's really about taking the reality of the worship service and trying to apply it to our lives. And usually, you know, you, you leave church and you're like all by yourself in doing this. Maybe you have a spouse or maybe you have a good friend. Um, but you usually leave church and you're like all by yourself. <laughs> and you like, you, you could talk about being a missionary to people and you could talk about all this stuff, but you're all by yourself, dude. You, you, that'd be, that's hard. So missional, missional communities are a way to do that together. And what, what MCs, missional communities, are is that they're, they're relational environments that are comprised of 15 to 50 people who intentionally gather around a common mission to reach out to a specific neighborhood, s sector of town, or demographic of Medina County. Uh, so what the, you notice what makes them different than small groups or house churches or things like that is they gather not around a house or they gather not around um, uh, you know a teaching or because they're all friends they gather around a common mission to reach out so that's the whole purpose for gathering is to serve and to reach out and this this idea that as we go as we go about the business of the day we make disciples so what I mean also by a relational environment I mean an environment where people um, who who maybe are seeking Jesus can grow in three directions, and maybe they're not seeking Jesus. I mean, ideally, they people would be drawn to, to missional communities because they are places of service, and they might be drawn to the service aspect of maybe loving a neighborhood or helping um, this, you know, maybe helping single moms or something like that. But a relational environment is a place where people have the opportunity to grow in three directions. Upward with God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, inward with with as with as fellow believers in Jesus, for them to be sharpened, for people to have good good relationships with the church, but also outward uh, with non Christians, with the community, um, you know, in service. Uh, so it's up in and out. That is that is the shape that you know you could draw a triangle and say up in and out, and you can just ask how you how you living those out. And we, we want people to be living each each of those directions out faithfully. Um, more just an, this idea of space we see in Jesus' ministry. Um, you know, Jesus, you know, the Beatitudes, and we have the Sermon on the Mount, and we, we have, like, Jesus feeding the multitudes, right, the four or five thousands. Uh, you know, you remember the fish and all that. Um, well, that's, that's more like a public type of space. Um, there's something that goes on when you're in a big big audience worshiping the Lord, right? It's not really like intimate, like you're not like with like one person. It's it's a big group. There's a group dynamic there. And that's 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 our worship services. Um, that's when we come together and we celebrate what Christ has done in our lives and, and what he's done on the cross and the victory we have. That's at our worship services. And that's gonna starting be start starting off, that's gonna be once a once or twice a month. Um, you know, another space that people usually go to, go to, you know, they have small groups in their churches and all that, and that's great. But that's really hitting the personal space, and that's the twelve apostles, and um, that's having like tight relationships. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you even have the intimate space where you have maybe one one or two people that you really share a lot of your junk, um, a lot of the stuff that you 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 don't want to tell a, a room full of people about. You might tell them. They'll help you walk through it, and this is these are the beloved apostles of Jesus, the, the apostles that were with him in the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, but what but what we're rediscovering really is the social space, and this is the group of up to seventy people of of this. These are the seventy disciples that follow Jesus, and the, this is the type of space that we're creating with our missional community gatherings. It's, it's actually going to be a lot larger than I'm sure many of you are thinking. It's, you know, if you have it in a house, 
it's probably going to have to be a good sized house because it's going to be cramped if you start growing. Um, and that's okay because within those gatherings, you will break into small groups. Um, but the beauty of the social space is that, you know, it's small enough to really have a common specific mission together. It's small enough also to really care about people, to really notice when people are hurting that they don't get lost in the crowd. But the cool thing is that they're large enough to do something about it. Um, they're large enough to really put a dent in a project. You know, like if you, you know, have you ever been in a small group of people and you say, oh, okay, we want to be missional because that's what Jesus said and you plan to do this mission outreach but half the families can't attend because they're out of town and, you know, you know, pretty soon it's stuck, you're stuck with, um, you know, you and your wife and, you know, your, your best friend and you really can't do the amount of work that you would like to do. Um, so missional communities are big enough to do that. So if a few people are gone, you still have a good chunk of people who could serve. And, um, you know, just think of it as, as think of it in like family terms, right? The missional community gatherings are like a huge family reunion, you know, where you might have 50 people at it. And the, the small groups within the missional communities, they're more like your immediate nuclear family. And then think of your, your um, the soul friends, that the really intimate type of space, uh, being more like, a, like your spouse or like your brother or sister. Um, they're, they're really small numbers, tight relationships. So we want to really have all these spaces really clicking and going full speed to really make disciples of Jesus. So if you're like my wife right now, you're asking, that's great, Ryan, you know, it's a great theory and everything. Um, that, that's a great idea. Now break it down to me. <laughs> what would a gathering look like? What is it? Tell me the details. Well, this this is this is what a, a missional community for Plant Medina would probably look like. But there's, you know, it's very organic. You know, it's, it's more uh, descriptive instead of prescriptive. But this, this is probably a good, you know, litmus test. People would probably gather, you know, like for us, it'd be probably 6 o'clock at night on a Saturday starting off, uh, hint, hint. And we'll, we'll gather at 6. We, we eat like maybe a light appetizer, maybe have some coffee or tea or beverage, whatever, uh, water, and, um, you know, do that for about a half an hour. And whoever is leading that missional community will call everybody together, thank them for coming, They'll, they'll say they'll say the name of the missional community and 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 their mission and this is the, another cool thing each missional community they don't become like uh you know just a generic missional community no they, they'll be called they'll have, they'll have a unique name that's that identifies them with their mission so you know if you if you want to reach out to um if your mission field is is um children who um Children of single parents, um, may, you know, you might you might have a cool name like U Turn or, um, you know, uh, you know Emmanuel, or you know, you might come up with a cool name and have a cool meaning, and you would tell that story each time, so much so that people would get sick of you hearing the story, but they would know why you're gathering and what your mission is. It'd be clarified each week. Um, then you'd go into a time of planning or debriefing from, from your mission project for that month, or maybe there's one coming up and how to, how, how you're going to, what you're going to do, um, who, who's going to be available and things like that. And then there'll probably be a time of teaching, not a sermon, um, not a Bible study, but of, of teaching of, you know, of teaching that's applicable to that missional community. And this a missional community leader would be responsible to that. And they, of course, would be um, held accountable, not controlled by me. Um, they'll be very low control, but high accountability with the missional community leaders. And they'll, they'll come up with a teaching. And then they'll um, usually give an opportunity to respond to that teaching or um, have people share a testimony um, to highlight that teaching. And then usually they'll break it. People will, will break into small groups. And these small groups are going to be led by the people that that missional community leader is actually meeting with um, privately. And all, all of them are getting together and he's, he's really um, discipling them, which means he's, ask, he's helping them mature in Jesus. He's, he's helping them, um, he's showing them how to walk as a Christian or she as a Christian, excuse me. <clears throat> and, um, you know, usually after 45 minutes of that, 
gather everybody together, say the Lord's Prayer, and you know everybody is dispersed, but usually people stay and hang out and um, catch up. So that's that's what it would be like. And where where is our first one? Well, the Northwest Mission. That's the tentative name right now. And as you can see, the Medina Town Square is in the bottom right hand corner of this picture. And where our house is on Patriots Way up here. And we're really trying to reach this whole area in the name of Jesus and really to to serve them and be the hands and feet of Christ, and um, and really minister there and. Um, you know, there's a variety of demographics within this area. Therefore, I anticipate there to be multiple missional communities and a more specific vision as far as our purpose and our outreach as time goes on. But we'll meet um, the first and third Saturdays of the month from 6 to 8. People could stay as long as they want. We'll be meeting at our house on Patriot's Way. And I invite you to come. If you have questions, I know it could be so awkward just showing up at a house. Um, just shoot me an email. Uh, plant, plantmedina at gmail.com shoot me an email, tell me about yourself um, and we'll be looking out for you so it's not awkward or anything um, but we'd love to have you we, we have, we've had so many um, strangers come in and they're instantly like family and it's been awesome um, so to bring this all together um, you're going to see that there, there are going to be people um, who will go to missional communities and will be in those type of gatherings but they won't go to celebration and they won't go to the services at, at, at St. George's. Um, so they'll be a part of St. George's in the sense that they go to the, the missional communities at St. George's, but they probably won't go to the services. Um, and that's unfortunate. And then there's going to be those other people who will go to the, the, the Sunday or Saturday night, whenever it is, services, and go to worship and be a part of that, maybe a very big part of that, but they won't go to the missional community gatherings. And that's also unfortunate. Because the desired rhythm for our church for the next four to six months is really to get immersed in this, this cycle of meeting together um, twice a month in missional communities and doing an outreach once a month together to impact um, our neighbors and people who don't know Jesus or people who do know Jesus. But we just want to reach out and love people and in a tangible way and not just talk about it. Um, we want to be known by this. Uh, and... You know, we, you know, but, but we don't want to do that. And we, we're also going to be having celebration services. We're also going to be worshiping twice a month. So like this, is, this is a rhythm for the next four to six months of having um, missional community gatherings on the first and thirds of having our worship services on the second and fourth um, Saturdays. And then, um, you know, one day a month, um, at least, at least one day a month, having some type of outreach to Northwest Medina. So you know, I know I know that's a, I know this is a lot, and uh, and you know these are some other ways, um, some other aspects of of St. George's and missional communities, and I you know I really want to get a Bible study going together. I really believe the Bible's meant to be studied together in a community. Um, I believe the Holy Spirit speaks through a community. Um, speak could speak through a person, but I think it, historically it's been through a community of believers. And um, it's a good check and balance, too. Um, so I really want to have a weekly Bible study where we'll go through a whole book of the Bible, probably beginning in the, in the letter to the Ephesians. Um, more on that to come. Um, you could grow by serving in worship and serving in mission. So that's the importance of being in a missional community, and that's the importance of coming to, to worship to celebrate. They both form you in profound and significant ways that will change your life, that will change the life of your family. And huddles. And huddles, i got to be careful here because they're, they're kind of something that develops organically. It's, it's like when you, you might hear somebody give a, a story or a testimony and you might be like, oh my gosh, I struggled with that too. Or maybe I'm struggling with that. I want to follow that person or I want to be, I see Jesus in that person. I want to be like, be like them. And you might say, hey, can I, can, can I meet with you for coffee or, you know, for, for, for dinner or something? Can we, can I, can I hear your story again? And can we meet, you know, is there a way you could help me grow? <laughs> That's what a huddle is really. It's really helping each other mature in Christ. And it's not a program. It's not a program. Hear me. It's not something you assign people to. It's, it's something that people call you to because they see you wanting more of Jesus. So um, huddles are a way for, for leaders, too, to really step into leadership um, by um, being 
held to to um, held accountable and held um, to um, to really follow Jesus more. So this the, you know these next slides <clears throat> I'm going to go over them quickly because um, it'll probably be edited and you know that's, that's the asterisk there. But this just lays out some of what's coming up. Um, you could download this in the PDF and go through it um, more in detail. But you know the first gatherings um, I'm going to probably teach a little bit longer because. Uh, I want to teach on you know just the Bible like what is it how did it come to be uh, how do you open it and turn the pages and where things are at and navigate it how do you like where do you begin reading it practical questions that we're off we're often uh, too prideful to ask right so I want to do two weeks of what I call Bible boot camp uh, we're gonna go out around our neighborhood and just go trick or treating. No real agenda or anything like that. Just go out and, and meet people and uh, maybe, you know, and do a prayer walk. And as we go, pray um, to see to see with the eyes of Christ how we can serve this community. How we can serve, you know, fa fairly middle class, you know, wealthy community. How do, how, how do they need Jesus? How do they need to experience Jesus and how what's our part in that? Um First services begin in November with a practice service. If you're really interested in serving or helping uh, with that, please email us and come on out for that. It's probably going to be a little bit longer than a normal service because I'm going to stop and it's going to be, it's going to annoy a lot of people. I'm going to stop often and say why we're doing stuff and 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 really kind of work through um, because because we have a baptism service uh, for Bailey Stafford um, the end of the November and we just want to make sure everything is fluid and clicking and is you know is not a distraction but is orderly and and holy worship to the Lord um, in November I also will begin in our missional communities um, really if, you know this is getting into the real rhythm of missional community and I'm going to do a three-part four-part series on the Jesus I never knew Especially because during Advent we looked to, towards um, the coming of the Messiah of Jesus and you know baby Jesus and all the baby Jesus jokes that happen and we all know baby Jesus you know Will Ferrell taught us about baby Jesus right but you know there is a Jesus I grew up with that um, that was like that baby Jesus and there was a Jesus I never knew growing up even though I grew up in a religious church I never knew the Christ of the cross. So I want to go into who was Jesus, what did he do? I want I want to give you the secrets. And I want to give you the cliff notes. This is what Jesus did. This is why it matters and this is this is how you live your life accordingly. I want to give you that secret. So you should really come out to those if you're interested in the person of Jesus. And um those are just some examples. We might have a vigil service that would be really cool. Uh vigil service you go through the beginning of creation and you kind of follow the story of scripture all the way up and there's like this longing and this waiting for this fulfillment for, for for God to come in flesh and then you know you celebrate Jesus coming on Christmas so those are the short term kind of the next nine to months to a year and uh, th these are the more midterm plans up to five years uh, these are the goals that I would like to see for St. George's and Plant Medina I'd like to I really would like to weekly worship um you know, within six to nine months and have those services uh, every week and uh, really to, to really start growing, um, to really have a lot of people step into leadership and authority um, and really um, for it to really be um, driven by the order of the church called the laity, um, the people who have been baptized into Christ, for them to take ownership of the worship um, and for me as as a priest, as a pastor, not to be the paid professional to do everything, but the people um, all have their parts in the worship. Um, I'd like for us to have our own space within one to three years. Um, it's not going to be our own church building, you know, build a huge thing, um, but just like a place where we feel God has called us to that we can minister and serve out of as our mission base. Um, I'd like to see multiple missional communities around Medina, around Medina County. Um, I'd like to, to be a, a full-time pastor. You know, I'd like for this to be my only job. I just can't, I can't wait. Um, you know, right now I'm kind of, you know, raising support as a missionary and I'm, you know, probably going to have to be a tent maker, which means I'm going to have a part-time job, which is awesome because I'll meet so many people. Um, but I really would love to give my life to, 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 
to teaching and equipping um, the people of Medina to, to share the gospel, to live, live lives that, um, that just have the aroma of Jesus all about them, that it, people's lives will be so transformed that you can't, you can't it's just going to be so awesome. So I really want to do that full time. <laughs> and I, I'd like to establish what's called a vestry at St. George's within one to three years. And what a vestry is, is they're um, kind of a leadership body within Anglican churches that um, handle all fiduciary matters. And what that fancy word means is they handle all the matters related to like finance and like buildings and budgets and all that fun financial stuff. And as, a, as the rector, as the pastor, I would be part of the vestry, but I wouldn't run it. Um, so I would like, that's, that's a, the whole getting back to the church, having more authority and moving more into um, uh, uh, leadership within the church um, instead of one person in the church, me. So everybody kind of having more leadership there. I, and like, I'd like to bring on another church planning pastor, really somebody to, to really for me to pour into and disciple. And ideally, you know, this person would be from our community, that, that the Lord would raise a person up and that they would be a church planner, um, maybe in Brunswick or another part of Medina County, or maybe the Lord will give them a vision to go to another county. Um, in Ohio, of course, maybe Wayne or Lorraine. But these are the long-term objectives for Plant Medina. Multiple Anglican churches in Medina County. No mega churches, just small neighborhood churches that are faithful, that people gather to. Um, um, you know, this Brunswick, Wadsworth, Hinckley, Lodi, these different places. This is over 20 years, too. Um, but as I prayed and as I felt God calling me to Medina County, I just saw like this spider web of spider web all over Medina. I got a picture of a spider web all over Medina and there was like clusters all in that. And those clusters were that where they gather for worship that, you know, what we would call church buildings or churches. Um, and those were the clusters. And then there's these like lines connecting and, and that those are the missional communities. And I saw, you know, at least 50 across Medina County, um, in the next 15 to 20 years. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to see the beginning of Plant Lorraine and Plant Ashland and Plant Wayne. I'd like to, um, to for St. George's to really be established as a house of prayer and an equipping center. Um, you know, St. George's, uh, are long-term goals. Like, I, you know, there's so many. Uh, like, God puts so much on my heart for, for what he wants to do, and it's awesome. Um, but these are just a few. I'd like a permanent building and campus, a really a place um, that's a mission base um, to prepare missionaries for, for you know, a place of prayer, a house of prayer, right? Um, that's not open for business hours, that there's no such thing as business hours because the business of the church is to pray. It will be a house of prayer 24-7 where um, people could come. There'll be a space that's set apart, that is sacred, where people could come and sit before the Lord and be quiet, that there, um, there will... Um, be a time where they could pray as Anglicans, as, you know, historical Christians, there's, there's, you know, even, you know, you know, look at Acts 3, you know, Acts 2 happens and look, look where Peter and everybody's going in Acts 3. They're going to the temple for, for prayer. There's set times of, there's set times in Judaism and early Christianity and, and even in today in Anglicanism where churches, where, where, where you pray, the morning office, morning prayer office, noon office, evening Vespers, and the, the, we'll have these prayer services. I, I'd like daily um, communion for people to communion services for people to come to. I love for Christian counselors and for um, formational prayer ministers to be housed there to have little offices there. Um, I'd love as as a, a staff, as pastors and stuff, for our offices to be there. So like when you walk in to work. Um, you know, it's, it's prayer and it's worship and singing and, and that's, you, you're reminded and you're hit with the kingdom of God and that reality that's in breaking and it's not a business atmosphere. It's, it's a worship atmosphere. So that's where all our planning and all our financing and budget and the, that kind of business, the things that we call business, it's being soaked in prayer that it'll be contagious. So, but you know, really for our character as a church, at St. George's, I'd like us for long term to be known for being mature, to have a lot of spiritual grandparents and parents. 
Um, cause spiritual maturity is growing and maturing, you know, like you don't stay a, a, physically an infant, do you? You grow from an infant to a toddler, to a child, to, a, you know, was was adolescent, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a teenager, young adult, adult, all this stuff. And there's so many probably more in between now, but there's a mat maturity that happens. And the same with the spiritual life. There's a spiritual maturity. So we want people who who grow up to be spiritual fathers and grandparents, and um, there to be many children uh, in Christ that are that, that come to know the Lord through them and their ministry. We want to be known for being deep. Uh, we want to be a diverse. Uh, we don't want to be all vanilla. Um, we want to be all. We want to be all types of people, all sizes of people. Um, we want to have a reputation around town that even people who who don't like Christianity and hate Christians that they would even say, but you know, like St. George's, they're pretty cool. I don't agree with them and anything like that, but they're you know they're so generous. They're such they have such a heart for service and and they love Medina. They really love Medina. Um, or you know, I want to be known for having um, biblical teaching for not for for not you know jumping to the latest and greatest way to um, to reinterpret the Bible, but that we have strong historic biblical teaching and that we're known for a place where you could go to be equipped, even if you're not a member of a church, and that we're a place where you go for prayer, um, even if you're not a member of a church, right? You get what I'm saying there? Um, but I just really have a desire for this and, and you know, if you're finding yourself resonating with this, if you believe in this, I invite you to help us make this a reality, to commit to this. And when I mean commit, I mean commit to, to being a member of our church for a year, you know, of, of not just saying, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll check it out, but uh, maybe check it out. But, you know, if the Lord's leading you here, commit to being a member for at least a year, um, you know, of of getting over the honeymoon phase. <laughs> I uh, commit you to tithe to the Lord, to the Lord each month, um, you know, um, to help, you know, I really believe this is a gospel ministry, that this is a kingdom ministry that God has called us to do this. So give to God, you know, um, tithe financially. I can ask you to commit to attending the gatherings and the services, to, to commit to attending both. I invite you to to come and, and commit to continually pray for Plant Medina and St. George's. And, and pray specifically that we remain faithful to, to the gospel, that we remain faithful to what Jesus has called us to do in Medina City and County. So I invite you to help make this a reality. I am so excited and, and passionate about this. I'm giving my life for this. This is worth my life. It is worth it. Um, so I invite you to, to come and follow me as I'm following Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.